Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam Nasser, and this is the Cleveland C Sharp VB.net user group. A little bit about the group. We meet every month. The meetings are free of charge and open to the public, and we cover any and all topics related to .NET. You can find the meeting information posted at meetup.com for both past as well as future events. And we always like to give a big thank you to our sponsors, uh, PostSharp and DevExpress for sponsoring the uh, post meeting prizes, which will be given using the, the eval forms. Uh, we'd like to thank the .NET Foundation for sponsoring the uh, Meetup site and NIS Technologies for sponsoring the meeting space. A big thank you to Manning.com. They offer us a 35% off selection of books, and the discount code for that is MTPCLEC21, and the link will be made available in chat and a little bit later. Some general information. Please keep in mind participation is encouraged. And like I always say, the only stupid question is the one not being asked. So feel free to jump in at any point in time with any questions or comments. However, when not speaking, kindly ask you to mute your microphone just to avoid any background noise, but always remember to unmute before asking a question. Kind of obvious, right? Uh, also, like to keep it casual but organized, meaning jump in with any questions or comments. Uh, at any point, but at the same time, we want to give our speaker a chance to finish all the slides as well as all the demos. And as you might have heard, the presentation is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube uh, within a couple days after editing. And so with that brings us to our feature presentation. Tonight we have Matt Groves, and he's going to be talking about cash rules, everything around me. Uh, Matt is a senior product marketing manager for Couchbase. Uh, he's based out of Columbus, Ohio. He's been coding professionally since the 90s, and he's been a published author of uh, Aspect-Oriented Programming in .NET, Pro Microservices in .NET, and he's also a published author for Pluralsight, and he's a nine-time Microsoft MVP. And so with that, I'd like to welcome you, Matt, and um, let me go ahead and make you presenter. Thank you very much, Sam. Appreciate the introduction there. Thanks for coming tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about cash today. Uh, not the cash as in cash dollars, but uh, cash as in C-A-C-H-E. And uh, I'm not much of a uh, Wu-Tang fan, uh, by the way. I'm very, very casual. I listen to the music a little bit. I did not grow up on the crime side, the New York Times side. But I, I enjoyed this song a lot, and I thought it was a fun play on words. And as it turns out, cash really does rule everything around us when it comes to a technology. So we'll see some of that today. Computers are fast. We know that very very fast this desktop i'm presenting on here can run billions of operations per second uh, but as we see from this chart as we get farther away from the cpu things get slower uh, input output uh, reading writing to and from a disk any kind of disk by the way not just the old uh spinning ones if they still make those but uh ssds usb uh, reading from a computer over a network is slow as well. Even reading from RAM is slow compared to reading from, say, an L1 cache or, or a register at the CPU level. But uh, unfortunately, a computer without input output is pretty useless. So we have to do these things. We have to read and write to and from disks. We have to read stuff over a network. Them's the breaks. We just have to do it. Um, so the problem is that uh, fast enough is never fast enough. Uh, so this is a uh, interesting slide, uh, and I think it's a little misleading. Um, it says here, every 100 millisecond improvement also results in a 1% increase in revenue. I think it's actually the other way around. Every 100 millisecond delay uh, reduces revenue by 1%. But you get the idea. The point is that uh, time is money. So we want to make stuff faster. How do we make stuff faster? I think the answer to that is, is probably caching. Uh, it's cost effective. It doesn't necessarily require any sort of major rewrite or rearchitect to use. It can be used with existing systems. And there's plenty of off-the-shelf caching tools and solutions out there. And I think uh, that cache really does rule everything around us. Uh, the CPU in your device is using cache, or multiple lo levels of caching. Your browser is using caching, right? You're familiar with Control F5. I'm sure your web developers are familiar with that. Your Android and iPhone apps all have caching. I know this because sometimes I have to clear the cache to get the apps to behave properly. 
CDNs uh, are themselves a form of cash, but they also use caching, and these are responsible for transferring a great deal of content across the internet. And DNS itself, which is kind of the backbone of the internet, uh, of the web, uh, certainly um, uh, uses caching. You have a DNS cache on your computer, and several DNS servers are, are caching only. So caching really does rule everything around us, and it's I think it's we should understand it better and know when and how to use it. So that's what I want to talk about today, because I think cache makes everything better. In this session, I'm going to talk about the basics of what uh, caching is, how it works, some common use cases and architectures of those use cases. We're going to talk about uh, how to uh, read and write from it, when to read and write from it. And we'll also discuss one of the hardest problems in computer science, which is cache and validation. And I'll end up with some, some trade-offs, drawbacks, gotchas you need to consider when, when using or when not using a cache. So I already had a pretty good intro from Sam there. He covered all these points pretty well. I do want to touch on the fact that I'm in marketing. Uh, before you just hit the uh, hang up button there on, on GoToMeeting. Uh, I, I am in marketing, yes, but uh, I think uh, you, might be, you might be surprised to see a marketing, someone in marketing giving a technical talk. But the company I work for is Couchbase. We're, we're a database company. It's used by developers and technical people. So I made the jump into marketing because I think it makes sense to have developers and technical people in marketing. Uh, Couchbase, by the way, is a NoSQL database, but it's interesting to bring up in this session uh, because it has a built-in managed cache layer. I'm going to show you some examples of how Couchbase handles uh, some of these trade-offs we talked about in terms of caching. Uh, you can also contact me on Twitter and LinkedIn. I also run an annual event called the C-Sharp Advent. I think at least one of you is familiar with this event. Uh, it's coming up soon. I'm going to open it up uh, for people to sign up. But basically what happens is we have people to sign up for this, and every day in uh, December 1st to December 25th, a new piece of C-Sharp content, a blog post or a video or a podcast or whatever, uh, gets uh, revealed as kind of a gift to the C-Sharp uh, community. So if you're familiar with Advent calendars, it's the same kind of thing, except we're, we're dealing with C-Sharp stuff. So uh, look for that. That's be coming up soon. That's a real URL right there, csadvent.christmas. That's actually take you to a website. Thanks to the magic of DNS. So anyway, uh, let's get on with it. What is caching? Uh, you probably have worked with caching, even if you didn't know it. But uh, caching is basically, it's a collection of duplicated data to serve future requests faster. And this was something that was first, at least the earliest I could find, uh, first formal description of it was from this guy, Maurice Wilkes, in 1965. He didn't call it caching, but uh, you can read his white paper there if you want to. It's, uh, I wouldn't say it's an invention of caching, but it's a description of what caching is and how it works, what the benefits are. It's a very, very dry paper, but if you want to learn more about the, uh, the, the mathematical proofs, the benefits of caching, you can check it out there. Uh, on the left here, you see it's a records. This is the complete data the system might use, maybe every single song uh, by uh, Wu-Tang Clan and uh, the lyrics, let's say, it's all in there. On the right side is the cache. It's a copy of some of the data from the records. Now, typically, the cache medium is faster to access than the records medium, uh, but also usually more expensive and or limited. Um, and that's just kind of the reason it works. So consider a hard drive that has 16 terabytes of data. And consider a, a cache that has 64 gigabytes of RAM. Now, RAM is pretty cheap, but it's not as cheap as disk. And disks are pretty fast, but they're not as fast as RAM. So we can kind of use uh, the RAM as a cache in combination with the disk in order to achieve better overall performance. So just to drive this home, if anyone's not familiar with caching, we're going to just do a, a real simple interactive demonstration here. So I want you to get out your smartphones, or if you have a second monitor, open up a uh, browser on your second monitor, and uh, we're going to demonstrate caching in action together. And uh, uh, if you haven't located yet, look for the uh, chat feature in the uh, in the GoToMeeting here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to reveal a trivia question. And if you already know the answer, if you already got it memorized, just sit this one out, okay? But, uh, you know, don't say anything. But everyone else, I want you to look up the answer on the Internet as fast as you can and put the answer into the chat. Or you can 
unmute yourself and, and shout it out. Again, if you don't have it memorized already, right? Okay, so uh, I'm going to get out my phone and set up a stopwatch. So I can find my clock on here. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so I've got the stopwatch, zero seconds there. And three, two, one, go, and I will reveal the question and then find the answer as fast as you can and share it with us. Okay, everyone got it? Okay, and three, two, one, go. What year was the Wu-Tang Clan formed? All right, I want you to search for that answer and enter it into the chat or unmute and, and tell us the answer as fast as you can. Okay, so Sam says 1991, I think. That's incorrect, but um, it's it's probably close enough. And Dave has 1992. And I believe that is the correct answer, 1992. Uh, so that took us 16.13 uh, seconds to go, can I see it there? To go from question to answer. Thank you very much, Dave, Chris, and Sam for doing that. Okay, now we're going to repeat the exercise. We're going to do it again. I'm going to ask this trivia question, and I'm going to use my stopwatch again to see how long it takes. All right? Three, two, one, go. What year was Wu-Tang Clan formed? How fast can we get an answer? Well, this is, of course, ridiculous. The answer is already on the screen, right? It has already been cached. It's uh, very quick for us to access that information because it's right there in front of us. Um, so the point here is that the PowerPoint, having the data in PowerPoint was much faster than having it, uh, having to go look for it on the web. Uh, so that's the trade-off there, is because the answer on the screen is faster, but it doesn't mean we can put every trivia answer up there on the screen, right? I can only fit so many answers on one PowerPoint slide. And even if I had infinite resolution, at some point it's going to just take more time for me to read everything on the screen than to actually just go and look up the answer directly. So it's a limited form of data storage that's just going to be uh, faster. So we don't actually need a, a cache dedicated to the Wu-Tang uh, trivia. Maybe we, maybe we do, I don't know. But what's, So what's caching actually good for? What's the more practical things that we can use caching for? So I'm going to go on to some caching use cases, but I want to pause for a second to make sure uh, we're all on the same page, that you kind of understand the basic caching concept. We'll, We'll dig into some more uh, technical uh, things around caching, some more uh, strict definitions. But is everybody good so far on that? I'll just pause for some questions. I don't see any in the chat so far, so I'll assume we're, we're good. We're on the same page. Okay, so caching use cases. What, what is caching actually good for? So there are a lot of use cases, yes, but I'm going to cover four popular ones. And I think they all demonstrate the use of cache a little bit differently than each other. So faster database access is a common one, uh, efficient API usage, faster browsing, and maintaining availability. These are the four we're gonna talk about today. So first of all, faster database access. You know, databases can rely heavily on disk, and if we're going to disk over and over for the same piece of data, you know, why not put that into a cache that we can access, uh, access from RAM faster? Uh, to reduce the pressure on the database and on the disk so we can free it up to uh, process more complex things that maybe can't be cached. So CRUD operations, certainly a complex operation, maybe, but even if we can't cache everything, we can cache a lot of stuff, and again, that'll free up the database to uh, process things more efficiently. Mainframes is a great uh, case for this, where we, we can't really do much to scale up the mainframe, or maybe we can, but it costs a lot, but some of the more mundane uh, read and write uh, tasks from the mainframe can be moved over to a cache instead. And then we can leave the mainframe to do the things that only it can do. Uh, so writing to a cache first and then to disk asynchronously can also speed up response times. We'll talk about that uh, for sure later on because there are trade-offs to that strategy. So this is a simple architecture uh, for this kind of use case. The cache will sit between the app and the database. Uh, now, the app can access the database directly, that bottom line there, when it needs to. But it's faster to get data out of the cache. Uh, and now, where that cache actually lives can vary. So this diagram shows 
uh, LAN between all these different points, but uh, the cache could actually live in the app, uh, in process with the app, or the cache could live in process with the database, uh, or the cache could certainly be on its own as is demonstrated here. So you can kind of, uh, I didn't know how best to diagram this, but I guess I could have three different diagrams, but um, so that's the architecture there, is that we, we go to the cache, and uh, if it's not there, we can then go to the database directly. That's a slower uh, operation. Faster web browsing. So this is something that you're almost certainly familiar with. Um, we want to cache common libraries and common binaries, uh, something like the jQuery library or Moment or, or uh, React Core or whatever. And this is what CDNs do as well, but except that they cache files in data centers that are closer to users, right? So if, if I'm uh, trying to access uh, moment.js, uh, if the CDN has that in the Columbus data center, that's faster for me to get access to than the data center in, say, Siberia. So when you load a web page and the web page wants to then load a bunch of other files, jQuery, for instance, it's going to check the cache on your own computer to see if there's a copy already stored. And that's, again, way faster than making a network request. If you don't have it cached, it's going to, if the web page is using a CDN, then the CDN is going to direct you to that data center that's hopefully close to you. And if the CDN isn't there or not being used or it's down, then your browser can go the full distance to Siberia uh, and get a copy of it there. But then it'll save it to your hard drive for next time. So the next time you request, if you did a page refresh, you don't have to go to Siberia again. You can just, well, Siberia for the one page, but uh, everything else you can load locally. So the the question that might that might beg is, uh, does that mean I'm going to have a huge cache of files taking up all my hard drive space eventually? Well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> we'll get to that question. Uh, the architecture for this cache, again, this is a very sophisticated architecture drawing here, as you can tell. But uh, basically, the cache lives with your browser. Um, maybe your hard disk, maybe RAM. You ever wonder why Chrome uses a billion gigs of, of RAM when you're loading up you know, Google.com? Well, this could be a part of the reason as a, as a huge cache there. But the point is, if we go to the cache, we can avoid making HTTP requests. Efficient API usage. So this is going to depend on the API, uh, what the API actually does. Caching isn't always going to help, but uh, what you can do is uh, you can reduce latency with this. If You can avoid making an API request to a server across the Internet. You can uh, do something locally instead. And it may also help you uh, reduce costs. So if you are using a third-party API, let's say like SendGrid or MailJet or something, that charges you, uh, you know, per request or um, you know, uh, number of requests per month, that sort of thing. Well, if we can cut down on those API requests by caching the results of some of them, then we're going to save ourselves money. So maybe improve latency, maybe reduce costs, maybe do both. Uh, so an example of this would be, for instance, uh, I wanted to uh, navigate from Shaolin to the New York Times building. Uh, and calculating the shortest path from two points is actually a very complex problem. Uh, if you ever looked into uh, Dijkstra's algorithm or A star or something like that, those are very computationally expensive things to do. And then imagine, you know, a billion Android users trying to do that, right? So but that's often going to be the same route. You can see... Google Maps here has identified three different routes uh, to the New York Times. And, uh, and this is, you know, calculating this route is, it takes a lot of computing power, but it's often going to be the same route. So instead of calculating it every time I need to get from point A to point B, I can calculate it once and then cache it, maybe on Google server somewhere uh, and maybe on my phone as well. Uh, so. We, we're caching this instead of having to do the computational complex thing. So Google can save costs uh, in terms of uh, computational resources. Uh, if this is a, a pay per request mapping service, we can save money by caching that. Now you might say, well, what if there's a construction or a car accident? We're going to talk about cache and validation later because that's definitely uh, a major concern when it comes to caching. So this is the architecture for that, very similar to database, except that the cache is uh, the cache may be in the API, but it's not really uh, relevant to us because that's a cache that we can't take advantage of. It's just a cache that the API producer is using. So uh, the cache may be its own standalone or maybe in the app.
And I've put a wide area network on here, but again, this could be an API that's local to my enterprise, for instance, but the same kind of principle applies there. Uh, but especially so if it's a wide area network latency or if it just costs actual money to make requests to an API. The last one is maintaining availability. So this is all about retrieving data from other processes. So it's, it's similar to efficient API usage in that way. But the point of this use case is not necessarily to improve performance, but it's to maintain availability. So the latency is, is kind of a secondary concern. Uh, and so the idea here is we have two different processes and maybe I'm in control of these two processes. Maybe they're in my enterprise, in my data center, whatever, but they're separate processes. And one process makes requests to another process over the network. Uh, and so immediately we've introduced some unreliability there because network can go down. The other service can go down. It may only go down 0.01% of the time, but it, it can go down. So what do we do in that case in order to keep ourselves available? So actually it's a little more complex architectural diagram here, uh, but let's imagine a microservices system. We've got two microservices, one for a user profile and one for ordering. And the order service, let's say, it needs to know the user's address uh, in order to process the order, right? But in the microservice uh, architecture, the address is information that's associated with the user and stays in the user domain. Uh, and so if the, if the order needs to go through, it'll make a request over the network to the user microservice and say, hey, I need the address for Matt Groves. Give me the address so I can ship him his order. Well, what happens if the user microservice goes down? or the network between them uh, is broken for whatever reason. Again, it may not happen very often, but it will happen. And so what you can do uh, to improve availability there, which, you know, in a, in a let's say a large e-commerce system, like let's say it's uh, walmart.com or something, uh, if that uh, service goes down for even just a few seconds, that can re uh, result in lost revenue. So we want to uh, have some availability there. So what we can do is, uh, this is one approach, is the user microservice, whenever it gets new data or updated data, it can save it to its own database, but it can also then go ahead and publish it out as a, a publishing, uh, as a, a an endpoint to subscribe to. Saying, hey, uh, Macros just updated his address, or we got, we got a new user here, um, Sam Nazar, and here's his address. So I publish out everything from the user and then other services in the system, including the order service can subscribe to that data and say, oh, okay, it looks like uh, Sam's a new uh, new user. I'm gonna go ahead and, and copy just his address information and I'm gonna cache that in my domain. That way, if the user microservice goes down or the network breaks for whatever reason, that's fine. I can still process the order because I have Sam's address information stored in my cache. Now it is still just a cache, right? So if that uh, if that uh, the cache server you know uh, power cycles or crashes or whatever, that loss of data is not a big deal because we can still the, the primary the source of truth for that data is still in the user microservice, and we're just uh, having a cache copy stored locally for convenience reasons. So in this way, we can maintain availability between services by using a cache. So. Just to drive the point home one more time, cache really does and can rule everything around us. So these are some of the use cases where you might consider using a cache, right? Are there some slow operations you want to speed up? Uh, are there operations that are constrained or limited? Um, for instance, uh, if using Azure Cognitive Services is another API that's very helpful, but if you're using the free version, you're only limited to a certain amount per month. So we want to uh, uh, improve that. Do we want to maintain availability when we're disconnected? Uh, is there lots of repetition? Lots of, lots of the same disk being accessed? Uh, does it cost us money to perform an operation? So once we are in the paid version of Azure Cognitive Services, that costs us a certain like a tenth of a cent or whatever for every hundred operations. So we want to reduce those if possible. These are all places where you should consider using caching. These are where caching can help uh, speed things up and smooth things over. So I'm just going to pause for a second here and check the chat, see if there's any questions that have come in, or if you want to come off uh, come off mute. There's, a, there's not very many of us, so if you want to come on the microphone and ask a question, that's totally fine. All right. We're going to move on here to reading from cache. 
just a uh, 101 here of, of how reading from a cache works. So let's imagine we have our application. It's our ASP.NET code or whatever. It's, it's our code. It's our application. And uh, we have an endpoint in there to, say, return uh, song lyrics for a given Wu-Tang song. So a user makes a request, they want song A. So we want to look up song A. So we have, uh, we have a cache and we have a database. It doesn't have to be a database. It could be any sort of, you know, it could be a file system, whatever. Something that's slower than the cache, which is probably in RAM. Right? So we look up A. The first thing we do is we go to the cache and say, is it in the cache? And if it's there in the cache, this is called a cache hit. So that's a, that's a, a caching, that's a term that's used with caches, a hit. Uh, getting that information from the cache is very fast because, like I said, it's stored in memory or, or it's local or, or both. Next thing, a user makes a request. We want the lyrics for song B. So do the same thing. We'll check the cache. Is it there? Yes, it is. It'll be a hit. So now the next user comes in and says, I want the lyrics for song C. I want uh, lyrics for Brooklyn Zoo. So the first thing we do is we look at the cache. It's very quick to check the cache, but it's not there. So this is called a cache miss. So we've got hits and misses. So what do we do now? If it's not in the cache, we'll have to uh, go and check the underlying data and retrieve that underlying data. So this could be our code doing this, or it could be some third-party component or you know whatever uh, doing this. But this is what I call the walk of shame uh, because it's uh, slower than getting data from the cache. So we go all the way around the cache, get to the database, and look up song C, and we can read that and return it. We can also save it to the cache at the same time for future requests. Um, now we'll talk about, because that little arrow there, it looks really simple, but actually a lot, of, uh, a lot of complexity can be introduced when you're writing to the cache. So, but now it's in the cache, so next time someone requests C, what's going to happen? And uh, usually I pause for crowd participation here, but uh, it'll be a hit. If we look up C again, it'll be a cache hit. So that will be a uh, much faster data access the second time around. But we had to go through the walk of shame first to get that. Okay, so that is the process of reading from a cache. Now, I, I mentioned a little bit of write in there, and that's the part that can get really complicated. So we'll talk about the writing into cache and, and the different strategies for dealing with that. So remember that a cache is duplicating your data. It is, it's being stored in two places with the idea that the cache is faster. So when the data is modified, the old duplicate data in the cache, what do we do about that? Or if it's not in there, how do we get the data in the first place? So I'm going to cover three methods of cache write. And there are variations and other methods, but these are the popular and common ones. So we've got write through, write around, and write back. Now, when I, I go forward and describe these, just keep in mind that when, when I say record, that could be database or it could be API or you know whatever, some slow source of com the complete set of data. And when I say cache, you can think of memory, you know, RAM, uh, a fast, a faster access, but uh, you know, incomplete copy of the data. And for system, I want you to think of your own code. Although, as, uh, as I said, there's lots of out-of-the-box caching systems you can use, so you don't have to go and, and, and write the system out in your own code. But I want you to think about as, as if you were coding this, the system yourself. Uh, so unless you're building your own cache, you're not doing that. But just think about it that in that sort of context. All right, so write through. This method, there are two steps. So system gets a new uh, slash updated piece of data, right? So Matt changes his address, Sam uh, becomes a user. First thing we do is we write to cache and record at the same time. And I've, I, I hope that uh, you understood that I very strongly quoted that with, uh, with the scare quotes because that literally can't be done. You can't literally do it at the same time. So what that actually means is a series of sub-steps. So first thing we do is we write that data to cache. Second step, did that succeed? If it didn't, then the whole thing fails, and we just 
we bail out, say uh, the right the right didn't succeed. Let's we'll try again or show an error message or whatever. Second step, we write to the record. Then we check if that succeeded. And again, if that didn't, then the whole thing fails. Bail out, probably have to roll back the cache uh, uh, and uh, just erase, erase it from the cache because the whole thing failed. But if we made it this far, then the write succeeded. So we actually wrote to cache, we wrote to record, and we're ready to go in the future. Now, this kind of sounds like an acid transaction, if you're familiar with that concept. And that might actually be part of it. We might create an acid transaction to write to the record uh, and then write to the cache while we're in there. And if the cache fails, then we roll back the, the transaction. So it doesn't actually matter which order. You can write to record first, write to cache, as long as you can roll them both back if something goes wrong. So you might say, well, this seems like pretty good. Why would I even want to bother looking at the other methods you, you mentioned? This, this seems like uh, um, the, the safest way to go. Well, the, the issue with this is that it introduces latency. We have to wait on a write to the record and a write to the cache, and we have to check to make sure they succeeded. Uh, and so if we're introducing latency, that kind of defeats the purpose uh, of using a cache in the first place. It's going to slow down our cache, which is kind of the reason we had it to begin with. But that being said, if you're working on a system that has way more reads than it has writes or updates, this should be totally fine. There'll be some overhead, yes, there'll be some latency, but only for that, say, if it's a 90-10, then 10% of the time it's going to introduce latency. 90% of the time it's still going to just be read-only mode, and uh, that's going to be, uh, it's going to get you a performance benefit there. Okay, the next one is called write around. In this case, your system, again, gets the piece of new or updated data. We write the data to the record only. So if it's a database, we write to the database only. We're kind of ignoring the cache. Uh, however, we do have to invalidate the record in the cache if it already exists, right? So if there's something, if the old data is in the cache, we have to kick that out. Now there's lots of ways we can do that. We can batch those up. We can mark it as dirty, that sort of thing. We can just completely delete it. But that's beside the point. We have to invalidate that record in the cache somehow, assuming it exists there. So basically what we're doing is we're deferring the walk of shame. Uh, so this data will only be stored in the record. So whenever we have to access it through the cache, that means the first time we'll have to uh, go through the walk of shame. So then why would we want to use this method instead of the first one? This, so this one works great if you are writing data that is not going to be reread right away. So it's okay to defer that walk of shame. There's no sense putting it into the cache if we know, generally speaking, it won't be accessed for a while anyway. So this is going to be uh, a faster latency than the write through. It's going to be faster. We don't have to wait on the cache to be written. So why not use this then? The, the answer is it's the flip side of that, right? If, if we have reads that are going to have to do the walk of shame right away, then we're really just, we're not able to defer that walk of shame at all. We, we have to do it right away anyway. So it's not going to provide any, any benefit to use this method. And the last one, which I think is the most interesting one, is write back. So we've got some data, some new data to, to write. We write the data to the cache. And then we update the record asynchronously. So we kind of do a fire and forget. We don't wait on that to see if it succeeded or not. We just say, go ahead and save this off, spin off a new thread or put into a queue or whatever, and, and then forget about it. It's going to make its way to the, to the record eventually. And then basically, as long as the cache write succeeded and we, that returns and says, yes, I successfully uh, saved that data, then we consider the whole write successful. So why would I want to use this method? So the reason I'd want to use this is because it provides very good performance for a mixed workload, which is to say it's not a read-heavy workload. It's not a write-heavy workload. It's like a mix, maybe a 50-50 or 60-40, 40-60 type of workload where we're doing lots of writes, lots of reads. This is going to provide very good performance for there. So why wouldn't I use this? Well, I think you've probably uh, figured that out already. It's the asynchronous part. Uh, we, we, since we're not waiting to see if the record actually saved successfully, what happens if something goes wrong? Uh, or if it takes a long time? What do we do in those situations? So what we do is that we can actually make this more resilient by uh, introducing retries, 
into uh, step three there. Uh, we can do multiple writes, so we can write it out to, to a distributed system, which is what we're going to talk about next, uh, where you know it's going to make its way into three different systems. You know, as long as two of them succeed, then then we're good, right? Now, uh, ultimately, there is always going to be some tiny window where the power could flicker uh, off uh, as some you know 0 0.01 microsecond window, for instance, and the data gets lost, right? So, if you're my age, you might remember. Uh, back in the 90s, right, when I was coding, you might remember hitting Control S uh, when typing your essay for school when I was, uh, you know, going to college in the, in the 90s and uh, working on my uh, research paper, my, my big term paper, hitting Control S obsessively because if my power goes out or, or word crashes, then uh, I would lose all that work. So nowadays we have a mitigation of that. We have the autosave feature. Uh, but even that isn't completely bulletproof. You know, I don't know if, if this is just me, but sometimes I open up Excel and it says, hey, we recovered this uh, spreadsheet for you. I'm like, I don't remember crashing or anything like that. I don't, why, what are you recovering from exactly? But anyway, it's a mystery. Uh, but anyway, uh, autosave uh, helps with that. But again, there's, there's always going to be a tiny window where if the power flickers at just the right time, uh, then uh, I'm going to lose whatever progress in the last you know, 0 0.1 seconds, something like that. So this is just to break it down, break down those three uh, with a chart. Write through has the best write integrity, but latency is going to suffer unless you have a, you know, a lot more reads than writes. Write around is good as long as you aren't reading the updates right away. And write back is good all, for all around mixed workloads, but you may have to deal with some, uh, some edge cases you know, once in a blue moon. And I want to bring up Couchbase now as an example because it, it is a database that has the managed cache built in. So we remember that architectural diagram from earlier. We had the app and the cache and the database. In the case of Couchbase, the cache actually can actually live in the database. So this is a diagram that covers how caching and persistence works. But basically, uh, you know, the application server sends some data to Couchbase. It gets saved into that managed cache, so this portion right here. And once it's saved there, it also gets added to a replication queue and a disk queue. And at that point, Couchbase says, okay, you've successfully saved this data. Uh, now, it hasn't been saved to disk yet, and it hasn't been persisted out to other Couchbase nodes yet. So Couchbase is actually a multi-node um, system. Uh, so there'll be other servers, uh, just like this one, that this replication queue sends the data off to so it gets saved there. But it, it doesn't wait on the disk before it considers it to be saved successfully. So this is a a uh, write back system. So it's very good for mixed workloads. So, um, so the only thing your application code is waiting on is that initial first write to one machine's memory. Now the reality is a little more complex and nuanced than that, but just to simplify things, that's, that's basically how it works. So time for some code. I promise there won't be very much code here today, but there, there is some code. Now, uh, when we are writing to the cache in Couchbase, we actually get a choice in the matter. So it's write back, a pure write back by default. Yes, we actually have a choice in the matter. So here's an example in C Sharp. I'm going to write my, uh, uh, I'm going to write the Wu Tang song "Protect Your Neck" to the database with the key of A, and then here's a title. We could have lyrics and stuff in here too, but just to keep it short, this is what we're saving to Couchbase, which is a database, but it has the cache built in. Now, this doesn't show the default because it's the default, but the default could be expressed like this, where I could say uh, durability level. How durable do I want this write to be in terms of the cache? And the default level is none, which doesn't mean it's not durable. It just means I'm not going to enforce the durability there. So I'm going to write it to one node. It's going to be queued up to write to disk. It's going to be queued up to write to other nodes, but it's not going to wait on those. It's just going to fire and forget and then return. Couchbase actually has other options. So there's also majority, which means it's going to wait for majority of the other nodes. So let's say there's four total nodes in the system. It's going to wait for the majority of those three other nodes to confirm that, yes, I got it and saved it to RAM. And it's queuing up to disk, but it's not going to wait on that. Majority and persist to active, which means we're going to uh, wait on the cache on one node. Uh, we're going to actually wait on the to be written to disk of that, of that same node, and we're going to queue it up to replicate, 
and wait for the majority of those to confirm as well. And finally, persist to majority, which is the strongest of all. We're going to write to the cache on one node, uh, Q to write to the disk, but only wait for the majority of disks to confirm. And same thing for replicas, Q to replicas, only wait for the majority of those to confirm. So that's a lot to look at and just a little bit of code here. So I've got some graphics to kind of show how this works. So this is the none, none durability. We only wait on the data to be saved to memory of, you know, I'm just going to say arbitrarily it's node one. It could be any one of these nodes, but node one. And I've also, I didn't mention this earlier, but there's a, I've set a replication factor of three. So I want three replicas of every Wu-Tang song uh, to be saved for um, availability purposes. Now that that's probably a little overkill, especially for a song lyric database, but it's it helps with the math to make this look a little clearer. So when I save that Wu-Tang song, it goes to memory on this node here and waits for that to be saved and verified. It'll be queued up to be saved everywhere else, but we're not gonna wait on those. We're just going to fire and forget. All right. Next one is majority. So this one is we wait on the data to be saved to the memory of the first node. And also we wait for it to be saved to the majority of memories on the other nodes. So in this case, two would be a majority. The other ones, it would queued up to be written to disk and memory, but we're not going to wait on those. Once the majority says, yeah, we're done, and the, and the primary one is done, then we're done. And everything else is, is asynchronous. We wait for it, or we don't wait for it. You see where this is going, majority and persist to active, right? So we wait on disk this time. So introducing a lot more latency here. And two other memory caches, everything else, we don't wait on it. And then finally, the strongest one, of course, is persist to majority. We wait on just about everything uh, to be saved and confirmed. So we're waiting on three different disk writes and uh, two different uh, network transactions and three write to memories. So that is a lot uh, of waiting we have to do. But this is also the most durable, the least likely to have any edge case issues. So we've gone from, uh, oh, and of course, these will happen eventually as well. Uh, we're just not going to wait on them. But each time we increase durability, guaranteed durability, we're also increasing the amount of disk access and network calls, right? Back to this diagram here. Uh, it's all about, uh, all about latency. So the first column is nanoseconds. Second is microseconds. That's main memory. That's so already a huge leap. Then we get into this one, which is uh, uh, SSD and LAN requests or LAN traffic, and then we get into wide area network traffic over here on red. So this is why increasing durability in a distributed system gets increasingly slower. Uh, increase, sorry, increasing guaranteed durability gets increasingly slower. So microseconds doesn't seem like much, right? But reading a meg from RAM is 250,000 times slower than reading from, say, an L1 cache next to the CPU. And reading a meg from SSD right here, 12 times slower than that. So when you uh, multiply this, you know, we think about just one at a time, that doesn't seem like very much, but we're talking thousands or hundreds of thousands of users potentially, that can make a huge, huge difference. Okay, so that's, uh, that's caching, cache writing and cache reading. This is another good time to stop and, and uh, maybe catch my breath and see if there's any questions or any comments. I know I've uh, I've dived into uh, distributed computing here a little bit, but uh, as as I'll, I'll show you later, there's a there's a reason why distributed might be the way to go when it comes to comes to caching and and databases in general. Okay, uh, I know we got 10 minutes till the Browns game starts, so let's uh, let's see if we can get through one of the hardest problems in computer science before the uh, Browns game starts. We're talking about cache and validation, of course. So let's go back to uh, PowerPoint as a, a cache again. So we've got the, the trivia question from up there. Let's say I add more trivia to this, uh, to this cache. Uh, Maurice Wilkes, the, uh, the guy with the paper earlier to describe caching originally, his birth date and uh, the year he died, 2010. 
uh, most recent Wu-Tang album. Okay, so I've got five total spots in my cache. Now my cache is full. But I have more data I want to put in there. So there's some other piece of trivia that uh, I need to look up and access. So what do I do now? Well, what I have to do is uh, what's called eviction. I have to pick one of these values and kick it out to make room for a new value to come in. That's called a cache, or that's called value eviction, or just eviction in general, to make way for that fresh new data. The question is, which one of these do I kick out? That really is the crux of the cache and validation problem. And that's what makes it so hard. So you probably heard this quote before. Uh, there's only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. This is a quote by Phil Carlton who's a very smart guy. Uh, he worked for Xerox, Xerox Park, uh, one of my favorite organizations, DEC and Netscape, working on really, really hard computational problems. So I think he would be one to know about this. If you've heard this quote before, you've probably heard a funny variation on it. And I've heard a lot of them. But if you have a favorite one, a favorite joke version of that, go ahead and put it in the chat there. I'm curious to see other funny versions of this quote. So one of my favorites is... There's only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation, naming things, and off by one errors. So that's another variation that you've probably heard something like that before. So feel free to throw those in the chat there. Those are all very entertaining and I like to see new ones all the time. So how to decide what to invalidate, what to evict. That is your cache policy. That's what that is, is a cache policy. And there's lots of different cache policies out there. Uh, my cash policy is keep my money in the bank. No, that's a terrible, terrible joke. I shouldn't have gone there. Okay, uh, well, let's look at some cash policies. So these are some popular ones, the well-known ones. Uh, the first one is called LRU, or least recently used. The goal of this one is to, we're going to evict the data that hasn't been what's called referenced in a long time. And what I mean by referenced means it hasn't been read uh, in a long time. There's variations of this LRU, but um, when you're using your cache primarily for reads, this is a pretty good strategy for it. So uh, let's go through the steps here. We've got a cache with a maximum size of three. And let's say we've got this, these reads are coming through the system. So our application, our, our uh, song lyrics application is getting requests for song A, then B, then C, and so on. So let's go through the first step here. Uh, A, okay. We get A, we put it in the cache, and we also give it this number that says how new this entry in the cache is. So it's not an age, it's kind of the opposite of an age, it's how new is it. We give it a, a newness number of zero. We bring in B, we put that in the cache, we give it, we increment that number and we give it a newness value of one. So which is the newer one? B is the newer one. C comes in and it gets a, a newness value of two. Okay, and now this point where the cache is full, the next value that comes in uh, will have to be, I have to evict something. But uh, fortunately for us, the next one is actually a request for B. So what do we do in that case? We update, we return B of course, uh, no walk of shame, but we, we update the newness value to three because now it has been read more recently. Okay, so now, the last read is a D. D is not in here. We need to put D in the cache. We got to kick out one of the values. Which one do we kick out? Well, based on the newness number, we kick out the one that's the least new, the least recently used, and that is A. So we kick out A to make room for D. And we give D a newness value of four. Okay, so hopefully you can see where this is going. So what would uh, then, just as a thought exercise, what do you think would happen if uh, I do a read for E? Which one's going to be evicted next? Go ahead and put your guess there in the chat. Which one's going to be evicted next? Yes, C is correct. C, Dave and Sam both got the correct answer. C would be evicted next because it has the lowest newness value. That's right. Okay. Next one is called NRU, not recently used. Now this one's a little different because it takes into account whether an item has been referenced and or whether it's been modified, been, been changed, updated. So not only does this take into account reads, but also takes into account writes. 
So the way you do this is uh, you give each item in the cache a score based on whether it has been referenced, whether it has been modified. So if an item in the cache has not been referenced and has not been modified, it gets a score of zero. So A and B in this case both have a score of zero. If the item in the cache has not been referenced, but it has been modified, has been changed, it gets a score of one. So that's item C. If the item in the cache has been referenced, but has never been modified, it gets a score of two. Now that's interesting there. We're going to come back to that. And finally, if it's been referenced and it's been modified, it gets a score of three, highest score. So looking back at this, we think the lowest score ones, probably the ones that are most likely to be evicted, right? So the zero score makes sense, right? It, it's barely being used. It's not being read. It's not being written. So it's, it's totally fine to evict that. And the high score makes sense too. It's being read and it's being updated. So it's probably an important value. It's probably being used a lot. Leave it in the cache. Where it's interesting is the two middle ones. So C and D in this case. The algorithm, it, L, the NRU is saying that being read, being referenced is more important than being modified. So the ones that have been referenced but not read are higher scores. So let's say I want to put another item in this cache. Uh, I want to put an F. Which of these values gets kicked out? So the, the ones with the lowest scores are ones that can be kicked out. But we have two in there that have a score of zero. Which one do we kick out? Uh, that's random. We, we uh, randomly pick one of the lowest score items and kick it out to make room for F. So that's, uh, that's the NRU. Lower score is evicted at random. And the higher scores will stick around. All right. So that's, that's the second policy. The third one I want to talk about, there's a bunch more. I'm not going to talk about them all today. But the third one I want to talk about, which is most interesting, uh, is the none. Don't evict anything. That's also a cache policy. Um, just leave everything in memory and don't kick anything out. So the question then might be, well, what happens if the cache is full and I try to put more data in? Well, what happens is that's an error. It's going to, the cache is going to say, I, I can't do that. Sorry, that's an error. Now you might say, why on earth would I want that? That sounds very limiting. Uh, it sounds like the wrong thing to do. Well, this is a situation where you actually want everything, want all your data in memory and you want to completely avoid any disk overhead for pure performance reasons. So instead of eviction, what you'll do instead is you'll have to monitor this uh, the cache to say, how full is the cache? Is it 80% full? If so, if we reach a certain you know, point in, uh, in fullness, it might be time to add more RAM to the system. Now, the way you add more RAM to a system, you don't just open it up and throw chips in there. Uh, it's probably going to be a distributed system, like I was mentioning with Couchbase, where you have multiple machines. So we have three machines. Each of them has 32 gig of RAM. They're approaching 80% full. We want to add more RAM. So we add a fourth machine, adds another 32 gig of RAM to the cluster. So we're adding more RAM to the distributed system. Now, why would I want to use this policy for caching? I would say use this policy when performance is extremely critical, extremely sensitive, and we want as, as fast as performance as possible with no disk overhead uh, possible at all. And we'd rather deal with the consequences of running out of RAM than um, having, having a slow down system for any reason. So that's three very popular policies. There are a bunch of other ones that are kind of fun. So uh, random replacement, just pretty much kick out uh, uh, an element at random in the cache. So completely rely on luck there. Uh, we can treat our cache like a queue. I use FIFO and LIFO, and then an eviction just becomes DQ. MRU kind of seems counterintuitive. We want to kick out the most recently used uh, item. But if you remember back to the the right, uh, right around, you know, if you have data that's not going to be uh, you know, uh, read right away, then this might be an efficient way to uh, evict. LFU is just keep track of usage, so kind of like statistics there, just keep track of what's being used and what's not being used. There's something called Bellotti's algorithm. I hope I'm saying that right. Bellotti's algorithm, which is not really possible to do in reality. It's, it's hypothetical. It depends on having perfect information about the future. But there are some approximations that have really cool names like Hawkeye and Mockingjay. Um, so you can check those out as well. Machine learning is a way you can also 
just look at uh, historical cache data and, and say, well, uh, you know, based on this, we'll train a model to predict when to kick out a value and w which values to kick out. So that's another way you can do it. And there's a whole bunch more policies if you want to check them out there on, on Wikipedia. So yes, cache invalidation is very hard. And if it were me, I treat it like encryption and don't implement something myself unless I absolutely have to. So it, it's good to understand these different uh, algorithms to know which one to pick and, and when, which situation, but uh, don't actually try and implement them uh, yourself is what I would say. Okay, uh, Brown's game starting, so I got to hustle up here. I uh, got some gotchas. These are these are always good to know. These are uh, these are important when it comes to actually you know uh, in production, like what can go wrong. Uh, most common thing to go wrong with cache is cache size. Either it's too small or too big. So you just got to monitor uh, the real world flow of data. If the eviction rate is too high uh, and the lifetimes are small, the cache is probably too small. Too small means you have a lot of thrashing, a lot of overhead. Um, so let's, as an absurd example, let's consider you have a cache that can store one user. We have a system that has 10,000 users. Well, that's completely worthless. Uh, that, that sort of cache is almost completely worthless because you know, you're know you gonna have more than one user uh, using it at a time. So uh, too small of a cache can cause that kind of problem. Too big would mean just you're wasting resources, right? Consider if you have a cache that has 10 times more RAM than you actually have uh, in in data, so why are we paying for all that RAM? You know, paying for the extra large uh, Azure VM, for instance, it's just it's just a waste, right? So uh, some systems like Couchbase again have some options for eviction, like uh, a value eviction only, which means it kicks out the value, but it keeps the location of that value, like where it is on disk, it keeps that in memory. So the walk of shame will be faster. It'll be more like a jog of shame instead of, instead of a walk, uh, as opposed to a full eviction, which just kicks everything out. Uh, so it's, it's, it's gonna use up uh, less memory, of course, but uh, you're gonna get the full blown walk of shame with that case. A bad eviction policy. Uh, so basically this means you wrote your own eviction policy, right? But, or you use the wrong eviction policy. The symptom here is that your eviction is going to spend a lot of extra time on overhead, checking the cache, and that's going to hurt performance. It's going to hurt latency, which is the reason we have the cache in the first place. So the solution here is that, um, you know, there is, uh, I've described these policies. They're very simple sounding, but they're a little more uh, to them in terms of reality and actually implementing them. So just don't do one. Don't write one, <laughs> I guess, uh, unless you absolutely have to. If you're in the cash business, maybe you'll have to write one, right? But uh, if you're in a situation where you're choosing eviction policy or write strategy, it's good to monitor a couple of things. So hit ratio, we mentioned hits and misses. Uh, you know, how often are we getting hits versus misses? Uh, and uh, latency, you know, how long it takes uh, from request to response, like, you know, is it 10 microseconds, for instance? So the higher the hit rate, the better. The lower the latency, the better. I can't really be prescriptive here because data and data access is different from project to project. Um, but if these numbers are bad, consider a different policy. But make sure you've considered cache size first because that chances are that's going to be the issue uh, before you have to worry about the eviction policy. The last one I want to talk about here, and then I'll wrap it up, is uh, close caching as opposed to distributed caching. So let's suppose you're running uh, multiple servers of the same app, like an ASP.NET web farm, you know, Kubernetes cluster, whatever. Each of those servers has then their own cache, right? Uh, if you're using closed caching. Uh, and so this is, if I have three web servers stood up, then I have three caches. And it's just whatever server you, your request goes to, that's the cache you're using. What are the problems with this? So the, the problems with this approach can be redundancy. Number one, the same item could be cached on each server. So we're, if uh, I'm making this same request for the uh, same Wu-Tang song on three different servers, now I've got to cast three different times. Uh, hotspots. So maybe one server, just by luck of the draw, gets a, a, a really uh, hardcore Wu-Tang fan, and he's requesting a lot of songs, and uh, he's filling up the cache. Well, the others are just kind of like relatively empty. Inconsistency. This might not be a bad thing all the time, but server one could have an older version than server three. Um, something to consider. Availability is another one. So if a web server crashes, the cache goes along with it, which again, not the end of the world, but now we have to build that cache back up when the web server reboots. 
So the solutions to this, if, you, if these are problems that you're concerned about, use a distributed cache. So it introduces network into the equation. Yes, I have to go outside of the ASP.NET process, but you can avoid these gotchas. And if you use something like Couchbase, you also get, as I mentioned, the scaling and the replication. It's just automatically included there. I don't have to worry about uh, creating my own shards and uh, creating my own replication process, creating my ETLs, et cetera. It's all built in a distributed uh, database with a cache. And, and by the way, if it's a great to use as a cache, but it also has, it's a full blown database as well with uh, NoSQL, JSON, full text search analytics, eventing, mobile sync and more. That's all the marketing you're gonna get from me today. Because uh, Redis and Memcached are also popular choices for distributed caching. Now, closed caching sometimes is a good choice. Uh, for instance, uh, if you have a mobile app that needs to keep functioning even without network connectivity, you're going into a, a dead spot, for instance, uh, then it makes sense to have a, a close cache right there on your mobile phone, your tablet or whatever. So you can still do reads and writes. Uh, and once you get back into uh, you know, a coverage, then it'll do automatic synchronization for you, which also Couchbase can do for you. And if you don't want to write your own sync, because I've been there and it's really, really hard to do. Uh, CDN and microservices from earlier, it's kind of like closed caching as well, but there's similar benefits to them. So. Uh, just think about that. You know, where is the cache going to live? Do I do I actually want it to live in the ASP.NET process, or should I put it in a separate uh, process? All right, that's all I have. I want to thank you uh, for being here, even though the Browns game's already started. I want to thank the Wu Tang, and I want to thank uh, Method Man uh, for your help. And remember, Wu Tang is for the children. Here's a bunch of references if you want to do a deeper dive on some of this stuff. Uh, I'm happy to share the slide deck with you, Sam. If you uh, if you uh, want to share it with your group. Yeah, absolutely. We appreciate it. And uh, more importantly, thank you, Matt, for taking the time to present. Um, very interesting, very informative. Uh, so definitely uh, time well spent. Uh, thank before you very much. We, you're very welcome. Uh, before we wrap it up, just have a couple closing announcements. Uh, so if I may just uh, take back presenter mode. And before everyone leaves for the Browns game, just have a couple of wrap-up announcements. And more specifically, some resources. Regarding the recording of this presentation, it will be edited and uploaded to YouTube within the next couple of days. Um, and uh, you can subscribe to the channel to get uh, the upload notifications. And as we're speaking, I am pasting a variety of links in the chat that I'm going through right now. One of them is the link to the YouTube channel. The other link that I'm posting is that to my blog, which contains all the tech events that we'll be discussing in just a little bit. And you can also subscribe to that to get updates. And then the last, but certainly not least, uh, the link that's posted there is for the e uh, excuse me, the feedback eval. So feel free to fill those out so we can provide some uh, constructive criticism back to Matt. Uh, once again, wanted to mention the special offer we have for Manning. The link for that is in the chat. Um, and the discount code for that is MTPCLEC21, and that gets us 35% off at the selection of books at manning.com. With regards to tech events, on uh, September 28th, which is uh, this coming Wednesday, we're going to have the .NET study group, which is going to be covering the first chapter of uh, uh, Fundamentals with Azure, um, excuse me, Azure Fundamentals, and the first chapter is going to be getting started with Microsoft Azure. So the link for that is posted there. It will also be posted on my blog. Uh, and you can also find the link for that also on meetup.com. So the .NET study group is essentially where we gather a group of people, uh, basically any participant that wants to join, and we cover specific topics within the, the .NET realm. And in this iteration, we're gonna be covering Azure. We're gonna, for the next seven weeks, we're gonna discuss uh, seven chapters from that uh, ebook. And that ebook is free, by the way. And uh, then afterwards, if there's interest, we can continue studying towards certification. But it's a great way to ramp up your knowledge of Azure. Uh, it's free of charge. We meet in the evenings. So uh, hopefully you'll be done with work and uh, putting the kids to bed and so forth. And it'll give you a chance to uh, update your skill set. Also happening on September 28th is the Cloud Data Platform Virtual Group. Uh, they're going to be meeting online. And then on uh, Tuesday, October 4th, is the Ohio North Database Training Group, and that's gonna be a hybrid meeting where they're meeting both in-person as well as online. And the link for that is also on meetup.com. 
and then October 20th being the third Thursday is the Glug.net, which is the Great Lakes Users Group .net. And they meet uh, every third Thursday, like I said, and they cover also various topics related to .net. And then on the fourth Thursday being October 27th is the October meeting of this group. And we're gonna have Jeff Fritz presenting uh, .net 7. So it should definitely be a great meeting. Uh, you can register for that at meetup.com with the link listed there. And then lastly, as far as conferences, November 8th through the 11th in the Pennsylvania Poconos is Tech Bash 2022. And that is an in-person conference and you can register for that at techbash.com. With regards to job openings, Tech Systems always has uh, jobs uh, available, but we always like to ask who's hiring and who's looking for work. And I know earlier in talking with Matt, and thank you for posting the link again, Matt, couchbase.com slash careers. There are several open positions there, uh, so feel free to check them out. And uh, also, like I said, with techsystems.com slash IT dash jobs. Uh, now, generally, does anyone have any jobs uh, open where they're at? Or is anyone looking for work? Feel free to make yourself known either verbally, chat, or you can email me afterwards. And speaking of which, my contact information, my email is snasser at nistechnologies.com. You can also find me at Sam Nasser on Twitter and my blog, samnasser.blogspot.com. And lastly, if we're not connected, I invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn. And so with that, thanks again to Matt and thanks for all those who attended and uh, look forward to seeing you next month and go Browns. Good night, everyone.